had your coffee. I had, I think, two cups, so if I'm a little, <laughs> forgive me. <laughs> um, as you said, I own Space Dog Books. I'm the CEO and founder of it. Um, but more than that, I'm an artist. I've been an artist since I was a little kid and probably will be till the day I die. So when I'm here speaking to you about art and technology, it's a little funny for me because uh, in my personal history, I didn't expect to ever be speaking about art and technology. I'm a traditional fine art oil painter who got into like doing art restoration for a while and then slowly changed over to doing illustration, children's book illustration, and then I got really excited about tablet technology. I liked computers. I do digital design like most of you who are commercial artists. I'm sure you use the CS5 suite. You've played with tools. But the thing that technology is doing now is that it's ubiquitous in a way that has unprecedented in human history, just unequivocally. It is something that we're now born with and go all the way through. The fact that kids that are coming up today are gonna have apps that are as precious to us as those old-timey books that we used to read is something that is totally new. And what's exciting about this is that it's not only you know, a new medium, new tools, it's a new way of thinking about what art is who our audience is, and how they engage with us. I decided when I decided to talk to you guys today, instead of just talking about the tools you can use as artists, because that's very practical information, it's a lot of information you get at conferences and things, that we should decide to talk about instead some of the philosophy behind art and technology when it combines itself. Because this is actually a really old-timey argument, <laughs> because technology has a tendency to people not like it <laughs> when it first comes out. Right? It, there's, it takes a little while for the old guard to accept it. And I think that's a little bit what's happening now, but I'd like to actually go back and talk a little bit about sometimes this has happened before in history, and then bring us up to now. So I titled this Roses on the Chains because when I was in my <laughs> younger days and I was doing a lot of philosophy and art history and thinking about things, one of the guys I obviously had to study was Jean-Jacques Rousseau. And while I personally think he's a bit of a pretentious prick, um, <laughs> honestly, if we're going to be honest about it, um, he had some interesting ethical questions about art, which I think still pertain, in fact, probably pertain more nowadays than ever before, um, which is mostly that art allows us to sort of pretty up right, the societal chains. It allows us to make things seem better. It's like bread and circus, right? It's pay no attention to the man behind the curtain, look at the shiny stuff, right? And I think as artists, that's happened. I mean, that's happened in World War II propaganda posters, it's happened with how cool IMAX look <laughs> and iPads look. I mean, it's, it's important on a consumer level as well as a societal level, as well as a political level. Um, but what everyone forgets is that the artists are actually the people in charge. We are the value, we're not just risks. We're actually the people who can shift thought. We're the ones who can decide what chains we make pretty. We can decide where we put our value. And for the first time, actually, in history, we don't have to rely on patrons. We don't have to rely on a big company or an agent to get us to our audience, because suddenly, our audience is right in our hand. 148 million devices. That is just tablets. That's just tablets. And you can get there without any middleman. You can be a developer for $90 a year. That's it. And work, right? <laughs> it's obviously more expensive if you want to do something really cool. But like, there's an endless, it's as clever as you want to be right now. And more than talking to you today about like how cool art and technology is, because of course it's cool. Technology is cool, art's cool, right? But more importantly, I'd like to leave you guys with the sense that as artists today, we have an unprecedented opportunity to change how we work, how we get to our audience, how they interact with us, and also the playing field. 
because suddenly I'm competing with Disney on the same field and they don't have a leg up because they have to market through Apple just like I do and they have to make a good product that people will like and honestly, I may put in more time than they do. <laughs> you know, It's one of those things where suddenly the field has changed and this is the first time it's changed to this scale. And I want you to remember how important this is as we talk about some of the things in history that have happened. So enough about that guy. So the first thing I'm going to talk to you about is linear perspective, which, okay, linear perspective, great. <laughs> Everyone's taken art history, I'm sure, right? But the thing about linear perspective is it wasn't really invented until the 1400s. People forget this. Linear perspective was actually technology in its day. And not just technology, but really cutting edge technology. And more importantly, the way that pictures had been made up to this point were hierarchical. They, the most important figure was the largest figure in the picture plane. They were mostly religious. In fact, the more important the object in the eyes of God, the bigger in the painting. They had some sense of like foreshortening, make things smaller in the back, but they totally broke it, mostly to deal with symbolism and you know, adding value into the paintings to show who's important. So what happens when you give suddenly linear perspective in that is that you break that down. Suddenly, it's real. Suddenly, Jesus is the same height as everybody else in the room, right? It's egalitarian. It suddenly levels the field. It allowed people to start painting landscapes and doing things like still lifes and like amazing, you know, Renaissance pictures of tiles and really start to change the way that artists actually looked at their medium. So how did he do it? He made a test, right? So he did, with linear perspective, which honestly he didn't invent, a guy named Giotto actually started using it before he did, but he was the first guy who kind of rubbed it in everybody's face, which I like those people. <laughs> so what he did is he took a painting of the baptistry in linear perspective, he cut a hole in the back, and then he held up a mirror, and he'd look through the hole so you could compare to the mirror, right, what you're seeing the reflected. So it not only had to match up to the baptistry you're looking at physically, but it also Euclidean geometry had to work because it's reflected in the mirror. So it was a perfect, perfect replica when people looked at it. It blew their freaking minds. They were just like, this is amazing. This is the first time they had seen. It was so real that it got rejected for a good long time. But now, how, who didn't take perspective in art school? Probably no one in this room. <laughs> It's one of those things that is taught now in studios. It's, it became, by the 17th century, commonplace, right? But when it first came out, everyone rejected it. They thought he was crazy. They said it was ugly. They said it didn't work, you know, compositionally. The church sure didn't like it, <laughs> you know? But it's one of those things that seems so simple now. Like, why the hell would you not use perspective, right, if you didn't want to? It's a choice now. It's an artistic choice. Whereas at the time, it was a dare. It was a risk. It was not thought to be aesthetically pleasing. It was a novelty, right? And that's the thing about technology. When technologies come in, often they're seen as disruptive, right? They're seen as a weak replacement of something that already exists. I don't believe that. I believe it's an opportunity to change and to morph and to push the whole thing forward. I really do. Because this has been going on in art since we were doing cave drawings, you know? Like, new mediums, new tools allowed not only new execution, but new ways of thinking about composition, about what we were actually doing and communicating to our fellow people. So the next example I'm going to give you of a disruptive technology is Civil War photography. So I don't know if you guys know this, but in Civil War, it's when photography had just come out, so they started trying to take pictures of the soldiers and you know, document it. It's actually known as the Illustrated War because they actually embedded combat illustrators into all the units, both the Union and the Southern troops. They still have combat Marines to this day, actually. And you can actually go look at the Gulf War stuff is particularly interesting if you guys are interested in looking at it. But they kept this lineage since the Civil War. So the reason they did this is because people <laughs> wouldn't accept the photographs. They tried to print it. Nobody liked it. <laughs> Nobody liked it so much that they hired all these guys. So Winslow Homer is a good example of these guys, right? Because honestly, photography also wasn't totally up to the challenge yet of doing things like really tight in stuff, stuff that's more emotional that really got people. One of the reasons it didn't work 
was because there was guys like Winslow Homer. This is a very important piece because this is the first time people are really seeing like people on the battlefield. It's not like, let's go take picnics and watch both sides on a nice little field fight. It's like a dude in a tree with a canteen. He's gonna be up there all day until he gets someone. That was horrifying for people to see, and it changed the way people thought about the war, and it was really important. So I'm not negating combat illustration, but what is funny is that they wouldn't accept photography so much that the whole war was done this way. All of the newspapers were done with combat illustrations, and then they'd run home from the battlefield and etch them really quickly and put them out that day. It's kind of crazy, right? Because they could have just done it with photographs. So what happened to all those photographs? They actually sold them cheap to farmers for greenhouses because they didn't use them. So, so much so that there got to be this legend that there was all these plants with like dead soldiers' faces in them, right, from the sun coming in and <laughs> exposing onto the leaves. It's so crazy. So, it's, I mean, this is a thing that's happened. And it's so funny because how ubiquitous is photojournalism now, a hundred years later? I mean, crazy. You wouldn't think, you would, you'd be like, really, you want me to go illustrate, like, the event? <laughs> like, crazy in a day? Like, you wouldn't do that. But it's one of those things that, uh, on its own, everyone just was like, it's a novelty, it's stupid, it's gonna go away, it's not as good as the real thing, the real thing, right, the traditional thing. But what turns out is as it grew into itself, it became into itself, people started understanding it was different. It's not a copy of an illustration, we're not trying to fake art, it's a different thing. So much so, right, that of course it led to art being inspired by it even, right? The Impressionist movement was entirely mostly supported by people being in love with photography. It was cool, it was the every man's tool, the middle class could hang out with it, they could try painting in their leisure time, which was unheard of, because <laughs> it was the first time they had leisure time. <laughs> You know, and they played with cropping and they played with cool light effects. I mean, it's like Instagram for, you know, the 1800s, <laughs> you know? So it's one of those things where it seems like something that's so rejected and it ends up even coming and inspiring fine art, which is something that really hates changing, <laughs> right? <laughs> so that's the other example. So that brings us to, those are two really critical historical examples, I think, of technology that was totally rejected at first, but then became not only critical, but like the standard. <laughs> so now I wanna talk to you about what I do a little bit. I believe we are right now at the next big jump. I don't think we've really had this since film, and honestly I think film was just a kind of a extension of photography, natural extension. The fact that the interactivity that we're allowed to do on these new devices and with HTML5 and basically any of the things you can do right now. It's as clever as you wanna be. And not only that, but you're engaging your audience in a way that they can't help but be engaged right back. If suddenly, not only are you looking at a painting, but that painting's talking back to you, that's a whole new experience. And especially if that experience goes on and is customizable to that person, then suddenly that person has an emotional engagement with your painting in real time, in a real way, that they are gonna remember. That's a whole new ball game, whether that's for consumer purposes, or for your kid, or for your mom who's never used a computer before, or for anyone. To create intuitive experiences that allow you, as a user, to like interact with the artist directly is unprecedented. And so I decided to start a company. <laughs> because I basically didn't want, I was a children's book illustrator, and I decided I didn't want an agent, and I decided I didn't want to have to move to LA or New York to, to be a professional one. I decided I want to make my own hours. I decided I want to make the stuff I want to make. I want to work with the people I want to work with, right? So guess what? I work in the cloud, because <laughs> hey, I don't want to pay rent, <laughs> and you guys can stay at home and work with your kids. So I hired my art director out of Florida, and I work with artists from Seattle and London and all over. And I have offices in San Francisco, and they're great, and we sometimes bring people there, but it keeps our overhead down really low and allows the freedom to our artists, right? And allows us also to match everyone very specifically so the piece itself grows with their own aesthetics and it all fits together, right? So what I decided to do was basically take a book 
Take traditional arts. And this can be applied to any, anything. Take what you can do as a craftsman. Take it seriously and apply that to whatever digital medium you like. If you're a painter and you don't like paint and like doing digital work, don't do digital work, but digitize your work, <laughs> you know, so people can see it and get it out there. So, or, you know, hook up with somebody that's an animator and try to see what happens when that happens. Using each other, right? Not saying, oh, I have to learn six months of After Effects and then I gotta go learn this other program. And it gets so overwhelming, you don't, you won't wanna do it. Find people that will help you. It's fun. It's fun to work with other artists and it's cool and they'll come up with something that you didn't even think of. But you can maintain your identity as an artist. You can maintain your aesthetic. You can maintain anything you want and take what you want and push which ways you want. So what I decided to do was create an interactive publishing company. I'm a children's book illustrator primarily and I didn't see in the field anything really worthy of kids. I saw a couple people trying stuff, but I didn't see anybody who used their own art. So a lot of it's appropriated art from the original, which is great. But that also means that the interactivity is really limited because then it's like whatever that piece can do on its own naturally. So we actually commissioned a former Disney artist, Matthew Crookshank, to do all of the illustrations in the book, 40, over 40 full page illustrations he did for us. Some are half pages in the book, some are full pages. All of them are interactive. There's voice acting, there's touch activated things. You can shake stuff and the bottle of cork will pop off and like, you know, vines will go and seagulls are doing, but it also is still a book. You're supposed to read it, right? It's 34 chapters, it's the original classic. It's supposed to be subtle. It's like Harry Potter's newspaper. They're alive, you can talk to them, you can mess with them, but you can also just read the damn book, <laughs> right? It's important. <coughs> so one of those things is, and that's how I applied my personal skill, right? I did, I'm not a programmer, I had a harm. <laughs> but I would rather the artists tell the programmers what to do than the programmers hire for cheap the artists and tell them what to do. Because that's the difference between quality content and not. Not to say the programmers won't make awesome stuff, but they really do think very differently from us. And it's a hard thing to wrap your head around because to us, you know, when I say, I want the leaves to fall down. I mean, I want them to fall down, <laughs> right? And a beautiful arc and S-curves and all these things that I know about. To a programmer, that means fall down. <laughs> so it takes a little time to getting used to. And when you do work with programmers, remember that <laughs> they're trying hard. <laughs> you just might need to talk to them a little different. But find people that can help you. Because I knew how to get, I knew how to get other illustrators because I'm an illustrator, right? I had worked in productions because I had done storyboarding for film. I had worked doing uh, special effect makeup for film for a long time. So I understood production. So I got people in each part, a graphic designer, an illustrator, an animator, a programmer, a voice actor, a sound designer, put them all together so we can do it one project at a time. So nobody, everybody can go have other jobs <laughs> if they want, right? And it can be specific to the project too. So you can really match everyone together specifically. And so that's what I would tell you. Obviously, you don't have to copy what I do, but when you guys are doing this, <coughs> think about where your value is. Think about what do I want to do all day? That's the best question you can ask yourself, right? <laughs> because you can. <laughs> there is enough people on the internet, there's enough ways that you can find your audience and you can find who wants you. Right? So you don't have to compromise yourself. You don't have to reinvent yourself every six months when there's a new technology. Figure out what you're really good at and figure out what really feeds you and because that's going to make your work better. Your work's going to stand out if you love it and it's cool and you have a mastery of it. If you're like struggling six months behind everybody else because you're trying really hard to be a digital artist when you're just not, or you're just quite not there yet, don't do it. <laughs> do what you're really good at. Because that's what people want to see, and that's what people are going to hire you for. People need good design. I will tell you this story. Two years ago, before I started this company, one of the head graphic designers of Yelp was like, oh, you're an illustrator? They still have those? <laughs> <laughs> With so many gra graphic designers and stock photographers, who needs real artists anymore? This is like the literally verbatim of what she said to me. And I was stunned, because who needs real art anymore? Well, I'll tell you who, consumers and they will pay for it. If it looks better, consumers aren't dumb. They get so much media all day long. They know what looks better. That's why Apple products sell more. That's why Pixar movies do great. 
people understand value in aesthetics. They're not dumb. People always say, I don't understand art. What they mean is they don't think they do. But when they see something they like, they see quality, they see stuff that someone's trying to actually communicate with them and not just sell them crap. People respond to that. So what I would tell you is if you are really into like serious, like dark, weird art, <laughs> go find forums for that stuff. Go find people who really are into it. I guarantee there's 50,000 forums for it. You know, on the internet, you find your people. Find people who will like your art. Engage with them. Talk to them. Ask them what they want to see. Make products that they would like. Sell it on Etsy. You know, you don't have, it doesn't have to be a one-stop solution for having a job in technology. It can be, I freelance graphic design for web designers who kind of aren't that great at graphic design. <laughs> But they're great at user interface design, which is something that's very difficult and not many people know how to do. You know, and as a graphic designer myself, I had to teach myself, you know, user interface, which is something that a lot of people haven't even heard of that before. User interface design, what the hell is that? It means how do you lead people through this sort of four-dimensional experience? How do you how do you like think, okay, if I'm them, what button do I want to naturally press? What's naturally gonna draw my eye? How am I gonna lead them through this? And then Take that a step further and be really creative with it and be like, okay, how do I make it intuitive now? How do I hide the buttons? How do I make this a natural experience so it seems like I'm making all the choices? You know, it's like giving a little kid a color palette for their coloring book. They can't really screw it up. You know, <laughs> it's gonna look good no matter what they do. So user interface design is something that I, I wish all of you to look at as artists just because that's what I mean about this is our term, and this is our new revolution. Because since photography, it's been kind of boring. <laughs> we haven't really had a new thing. And people are tending to look at digital art like it's a poor copy, like, oh, vector art, yeah. <laughs> you know, and it's not that way. It can be, or, oh, it's just for concept art, or just for game art, or it's, you know, everyone's trying to compartmentalize what it is. But if you look at like somebody like John Foster, an amazing illustrator mostly for young adult books, John Foster does traditional oil paintings and then takes them and digitally manipulates them. Incredible results. So, you know, you can figure out any part of this, but figure out how the technology can push you. Because now there's so much of it and it's changing all the time that you can't focus on the tools. Focus on yourselves. Focus on your own value. Focus on what can I do that no one's done before because this is the first time we really like can do this again because there's been a lot of art so pretty much any idea you've probably already had has probably already been done at least once somewhere so to take it and suddenly go I want this little kid to have a magical experience where instead of you know a picture of Long John Silver suddenly he's telling him about the first time he saw a mermaid you know or like you actually you know see him rowing to the damn boat he's tired and he's, you know, you're with him, you're with him. And that creates a whole new thing. So whatever your art is, find how you can create meaning and use that interactivity to, to make it a whole new art. Because this is the first time we've gotten to do this. I'm really excited to see what people do. Because it's, it's so easy. It's as clever as you want to be, you know? So I'm going to talk about, the last thing I'm going to talk about today is sort of the tools, right? So, I say there's always three P's of the digital age, promotion, production, and publication, because as an artist, you can find work in any of these, and any stages of these. So I don't mean that you need to go work for a publishing house. I mean that you can work for them as a graphic designer, as someone who does their animation, as someone who does their website, as someone who does their ebook design. Learn iBooks author, it is so easy. <laughs> you guys can make your own books and put them out. You know, you can self-publish for like very little. As if you know any program, you can get through these. They're not hard. They're made to be simple. Publication is changing. Publication is hard. There are a lot of big players, and they are starting to get wise. When I started my company, nobody really knew what was going on yet. So it was easy for us to kind of come in and kind of do what we want and show off. <laughs> now the big kids are getting smart. So. It's a little harder, I won't lie to you, to be an independent publisher now, but it's a lot easier to be a self-published author because now you can take your beautiful InDesign document and give it to Amazon, put it out on their Kindle, or put it on the iBook store, or do whatever. It may not be as interactive as what we do, but it's beautiful, and it's out, and it's on 
14 million tablets, <laughs> you know? So why not? What's the risk to you? How many hours does that take for you to do something like that? So publication is one of those ways where you can find yourself in the pipeline or you can be the pipeline. The other one is production. I'm going backwards. <laughs> uh, production's interesting because people need stuff. People want to buy stuff. It doesn't go away. People like products. People like t-shirts. People like cool prints. People like stuff you can buy on Etsy. Get a store on Etsy. If you don't want to do anything else, make some stupid stuff and put it on Etsy. <laughs> Because it's great. They do all the work for you. It's not expensive. It really means something when someone gets something from an artist. They love it. They send handwritten notes. They get super excited. Get a little pats on the back. It's good. <laughs> you know? You can also be part of a production line for someone else. Make t-shirts for Threadless. Go make cups for somebody. You know, like it's one of those things people need design. There's a lot of people who do uh, like tins, you know, like for mints now and fancy packaging. Hook up with those people. Hook up with people who need good logos. Go to people's websites and local businesses that you see who like need some help. <laughs> and be like, bros, <laughs> I gotcha. So the other one is promotion, right? And that kind of ties back into production, which I was just talking about, is people need logos, people need help, people need help dressing themselves up, people need Facebook avatars, and they need, you know, cool looking websites, and they need swag, you know? like. For a little while, I was doing like fitness blogs and making them like yoga mats and stuff and surfboards. Do whatever, because you can. Because you don't have to pigeonhole yourself. It's not, I'm a cross-section illustrator, or I'm a concept artist, or whatever. You're artists. Go make art. Do it however you can. Because that's going to keep you more interested. It's going to let you do more for less. It's going to let you be the forefront and not have to be behind an agent or a big company. It's going to allow you to manage your value as artists and put it where you want to put it. Not where someone else is going to, or a paycheck puts it, but where you actually want to spend your time putting it. It takes legwork. It takes a lot more work than if you work for a company nine to five because you got to self-promote or you got to go find those people and talk to them. But like, I started my company with like seven emails. Just being like, I have this really crazy idea <laughs> and I really like your stuff and I think we can do cool stuff together, you know? It doesn't, this is not rocket science. Just talk to each other, use each other. This stuff is so easy, you know? And it seems unsurmountable because it's technology and it's hard and it's weird and new, but it's not. A three-year-old can use an iPad, you know? You don't have to be the ones coding it, but be the ones thinking about how to use it. Because this is the first time as artists that we have this opportunity, and I can't emphasize that enough, that we have an opportunity to have a new chapter in art history to have a transmedia chapter and be the ones pushing it forward and not in a, like a cool novel way like oh yeah I was really into Dada <laughs> you know or something in a way that's uh, game changing in a way that in 50 years from now people are going to be like well of course that's how you like experience art <laughs> you know that's a weird thing to think about you know but it's so so exciting so I really encourage you guys to find your value find what you like to do Find other people who can help you do with that and just go crazy and be as clever as you want to be. So that's it. <laughs> <laughs>